Good morning. Welcome to you on this Sabbath day. Welcome to the second Sunday in Lent. You know, Lent is a season that is traditionally understood as being 40 days in length. But if you count the calendar days, you get up with more than 40. But that's because we don't include the six Sundays of Lent as part of the Lenten season. Sundays are always little Easter's, and so they don't count as part of that period of time leading up to Easter. For those of you that might be worshiping with us for the first time, know that you can always download our worship sheets at lnpc.org. If you're an Apple user, you'll see an icon at the top, and that'll allow you to scroll down through the sheets as we proceed through worship. The gathering will be meeting this afternoon for worship and prayer at 4 p.m. out on the patio and lawn. We invite you to bring a lawn chair, bring a mask. It's always a good idea maybe to have a light sweater or a light jacket because it can get a little cool, but it is a warm time of fellowship and worship. So we invite you to come and be a part of that. Our youth pastors' Bible studies, open door, the Monday prayer groups, and the choir fellowship are all meeting on Zoom. You can call the church office to get details on being a participant in those uh, those offerings. Our Lenten class has begun. It meets on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., and these are being held on Zoom. And we are looking at the last seven words or the last seven sentences spoken by Jesus as he hung on the cross. Each class lasts about 45 minutes long or so. It's it's proving to be a powerful time. As we look at these seven statements of Jesus and think about their impact on our lives today. So we invite you to come and be a part of that. And again, you can call the church office to get that Zoom invitation for the class. We are having our annual meeting today at 1 p.m. We will be live streaming the annual meeting. But if you have registered, it is absolutely critical that you show up for the meeting. And that's because we can't do any business if we don't have a quorum, if we don't have a certain number of participants. So please, even though we're live streaming the service, if you have registered to attend, we need each and every one of you to still come join us here in the sanctuary at 1 p.m. and be a part of the service. We will be Uh, streamlining the annual meeting to a certain extent to accommodate the COVID protocols that we have to follow. You'll come to two desks that are located right outside the sanctuary doors. You'll be screened, we'll take your temperature, we'll ask you the typical COVID questions, and then you'll be told where your seat is. And each seat has a little name placard right in front of it, as well as the annual reports. It is really important that you use the seat that we have assigned for you because that's how we are able to maximize participation. It's also important that you maintain the the social distances and and as as tempting as it will be, be really careful about not hugging each other as as we greet one another and come into into the annual meeting. It's gonna be a great time to, to be together. We are happy to be live streaming it so as many people as possible can be aware of the information that's going to be shared there. Um, We just need to follow the protocols as outlined by the state. Finally, we are planning an outdoor worship service in the parking lot for Easter. Being outside, we have some, some more flexibility on seating, no flexibility about distances and masks, but we're we're able to do some things outdoors that we can't do indoors, mostly singing and, and praying aloud together. So stay tuned for more information about that as we we get closer to Holy Week. And now I want to invite you to join with me in our call to worship. Come to the water, all you who thirst. Come to drink deeply from the river of life. Come to the water, all you who are weary. We come to rest in the quiet pools of God's love. Come to the water, all you who long for justice. We come to be renewed in God's ever-flowing stream. For God is here among us, washing away the dust and grime of our lives and pouring out the Spirit on all who thirst. Let us worship God together. 
I invite you now to join with me in our opening prayer. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for this season of Lent during which you invite us to come, to examine, to confess, to be renewed and healed. We have begun this journey eagerly, anticipating that, like Jesus in the wilderness, there are things which need to be lost so that better things may be found. Grant us courage to set aside easy answers and quick fixes in favor of your word that penetrates and transforms us. Enable us to see past the immediate satisfaction of our wants that we may choose instead the eternally fulfilling grace of your presence. Embolden our faith that we may trust you rather than the false and empty promises of our age. Thank you for walking through this Lenten journey with us. May we emerge from it prepared to serve you with renewed passion and joy. Amen. Good morning. Let us all join each other and worship the Lord. Praise Him, you thunder clouds, ringing throughout the heavens, from every mountain top. To every wild ocean, oh, hear all the universe sing praise. Oh, sing praise, let everything that breathes, let all the earth proclaim, great is the Lord our God, praise him forever. Let all that is within me magnify his name. Great is the Lord our God. Praise him forever. Praise him forever. Praise him, you beating hearts. Sing for the life he's given. Praise him, you rescued ones. Join in the sound of heaven from every mountain top to every wild ocean. Oh, hear all the universe sing praise. Oh, sing praise, let everything that breathes, let all the earth proclaim, great is the Lord our God, praise him forever. Let all that is within me magnify his name, great is the Lord our God. Praise Him forever. Praise Him forever. Praise Him forever. star burns in the darkness shines with the promise Emmanuel one child born in the stillness living within us Emmanuel we're singing glory glory let there be peace let there be peace singing glory glory let there be peace let it start in me one voice speaks for the voiceless hope for the hopeless Emmanuel one love brings us to 
together now and forever Emmanuel do not be afraid his love is strong enough to save us nothing stands in the way his love is strong enough to lead us singing glory glory let there be peace let there be peace singing glory glory let there be peace let it start in me we're singing glory glory let there be peace let there be peace we're singing glory glory let there be peace let it start in me Thank you, Paul. That is absolutely amazing. Let it start within us and that voice for the voiceless. Let it start with us. Thank you for just worshiping within our hearts and minds. Thank you so much, Paul. Now, as part of our preparation for worship, we prepare our hearts to hear and experience God's word through an act of humility, repentance, and prayer. In the prayer of confession, we declare our need and dependence on God's saving grace. In the following declaration of forgiveness, we receive that grace, and with forgiven souls, we are then ready for worship. Convinced of our need and dependent upon God's grace alone, let us humbly and sincerely come before God for confession and repentance. Let us pray together. Merciful God, you have surrounded us with abundant good and invited us to partake. Rather than respond with gratitude, we long for that which we do not have. We compare ourselves to others and want more, different, newer, shinier, we fail to discipline our desires, and instead of glorify and indulge them, we want maturity without growing pains, character without effort, courage without testing, wisdom without difficulty. Lord, forgive our foolish ways. Grant us instead a longing for your presence and a burning passion for your truth. Above all else, may we seek to know your heart, to delight in your presence, and to desire your ways and thoughts which are higher than ours. In humility, then, we confess the sin that we separates us from you. Amen. Friends, the mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting. We cannot outlive it, outgrow it, or blow it so badly that God's forgiving love does not reach us and cleanse us. This is good news. Hear and receive it and live as God's beloved, made whole and new. Amen. I invite you now to join with us as we sing our joyful response to God's great mercy and love.
And now, as God's forgiven people, we invite you to share that joy you have as God's beloved, either with people in your own home or through comments on Facebook. Let us now share that peace with one another through Christ. Judy, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Thank you. And the peace of Christ be with you, Suk, Carlos, John, Gareth, and Jim, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with all of you at home, sitting in your homes, tuning us in this morning, the peace of Christ be with you. And now we are blessed as CM leads us through our time for young disciples. Good morning. I'd like to welcome the children to gather around for this morning's children's message. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm here with our fuzzy friends again this morning. And this morning, we've been talking about what we're going to do today. We decided that after church, we're going to play, and then we're going to take a nice Sunday afternoon nap, then we're going to have dinner, and then we're going to go for a nice walk outside. That sounds like a good day, doesn't it? Well, Mr. Polar Bear liked the idea, except for the walk outside. He said, won't it be dark outside after dinner? Mr. Lion said, yes, it's going to be dark. Well, Mr. Chihuahua said, no problem. I'll bring a flashlight so we can see in the dark. Well, Mr. Polar Bear thought that might be a good idea, but he also said, well, Mr. Chihuahua, you need to make sure to check the batteries, make sure that the batteries work. And you need to make sure and check the light bulb and make sure the light bulb isn't burnt out. So Mr. Chihuahua did that and his flashlight is ready to go. Well, Mr. Polar Bear, he wanted to hold the flashlight on our walk in the dark, but See, that won't work because if everyone's following Mr. Chihuahua, then the only one in the light would be Mr. Polar Bear and Mr. Chihuahua and Mr. Lion would be in the dark. So we decided Mr. Chihuahua is gonna hold the flashlight while we go for our walk and the rest of our fuzzy friends will follow the light. They'll follow the light. Well, boys and girls, the Bible says that Jesus is the light of the world. And when we follow him, we will have the light of life and God will be with us. Remember how Mr. Polar Bear wanted Mr. Chihuahua to check that light bulb in the flashlight to be sure it didn't burn out? Well, guess what? The light of Jesus never burns out and the light of Jesus shines through us too. Remember like we sing our song in Sunday school? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. So boys and girls, my message for you this morning is simple, but it's super cool and super important. Follow the light, follow Jesus, and let his light shine through you, because he is the light of the world. So let's sing our prayer song, and then we'll pray. God is always near me. God will always hear me when I pray. Bow your heads with me, boys and girls. Dear loving God, thank you so much for the light of the world, Jesus. Thank you for the gift of Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So boys and girls, I hope you have a beautiful Sunday. And remember, Jesus is the light of the world. Bye-bye for now. Thank you, CM. Jesus is the light of the world. That's beautiful. Thank you. Your children's messages are just perfect for all of us. Now, the first lesson for today is from the book of Exodus, chapter 13, verses 17 through 22. Hear the word of the Lord. When Pharaoh let the people go, 
God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was nearer. For God thought, if the people face war, they may change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people by the roundabout way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of the land of Egypt prepared for battle. And Moses took with him the bones of Joseph, who had required a solemn oath of the Israelites, saying, God will surely take notice of you, and then you must carry my bones with you from here. They set out from Succoth and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, so that they might travel by day and by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson for today continues in this series as we're looking at these great I am statements of Jesus from John chapter 8, verses 12 through 20. I, I invite you to open up your Bibles from home, fire up that Bible app on your phone or on your tablet or laptop. Let's read together John chapter 8, verses 12 through 20. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Then the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying on your own behalf. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid because I know where I have come from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one, yet even if I do judge, my judgment is valid. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is valid. I testify on my own behalf, and the Father who sent me testifies on my behalf. Then they said to him, Who is your father? And Jesus answered him, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while he was teaching in the treasury of the temple. But no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. There ends our scripture readings for today. I invite you to join with me in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit that takes this word, illuminates this word, clarifies this word, and then presses it onto the hearts of believers. And Lord God, we would pray for a mighty outflow of that ministry in our midst right now. Speak to us through these texts. Speak to us of important things. 
And may our lives be changed. May our behavior reflect those changes. May we grow ever more closely into the likeness of Christ. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. As we journey together in this season of Lent, as we think together about the radical I am claims of Jesus, you're probably going to get tired of me speaking about the importance and depth brought on by our understanding of the context within which Jesus makes his statements. Individuals have ripped particular texts out of Scripture, out of the context in which the text is placed, to justify all kinds of secular horrors. Slavery, the abuse of women, apartheid, these all had early supporters misusing Scripture to maintain their positions of oppressive power and authority. The church itself has been guilty of this sin, the sin of distorting Scripture to maintain its position of, of cultural power and prominence. More than one denomination here in America split in the mid-1800s over the issue of slavery. The departing group always claimed a scriptural warrant for its position. Most of these groups in subsequent decades confessed their misuse of scripture in arguing for a continuance of slavery. But thankfully the neglect is not always so dire. Sometimes we simply rob ourselves of the richness, of the depth, of the layers of Scripture if we don't take the time to understand context. And, and today's passage from John is a good example of that. The Feast of the Tabernacles, or Sukkot, was one of the three great pilgrimage feasts that all faithful Jews were expected to attend. Early on, Sukkot was a harvest festival, but it fairly quickly evolved into a feast that celebrated God's provision, God's care and direction for Israel as they escaped from Egypt. And the Feast of Tabernacles, or also known as the Feast of Booths, was a fall festival celebrated by the by the construction of small booths or huts using the branches and foliage of a date palm tree, myrtle, willow, and lemon tree. And for the eight days of Sukkot in Israel, me meals were to be eaten in these booths. And there were special observances in the temple each day. Important for our lesson. There was also a huge, ornately constructed candelabra that was kept lit for the entire festival, reminding Israel of the pillar of fire mentioned in our first text as read by Pastor Annette. There were also special torch parades that would travel about first century Jerusalem. And Jesus, faithful Jew that he was, had come to Jerusalem as required to celebrate the festival of the booths. In fact, at the end of chapter 7 of John's Gospel, it tells us that the festival has just ended. But certainly light, a fire to follow, a light as a sign of God's special provision and care, this symbol would have been fresh in the mind of those listening to Jesus. And Jesus, as was, as was often his practice, in our text now is in the temple, in the court of the treasury, also known as the court of the women, because it was the last court area open to both Jewish men and Jewish women before one entered the areas of the temple reserved for men 
and the priests. In the context of Sukkot, in a celebration of God's leadership symbolized by fire, in the temple where the large candelabra had just been lit to celebrate God as a leading light, Jesus makes the astounding claim. I, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And certainly the listeners of his day would have immediately understood what Jesus was claiming, and so should we. In our modern world, in in Southern California, it is difficult to understand the weightiness that can accompany darkness. Surrounded by light, comforted and guided by by modern technology like GPS systems, it is difficult for us to experience and understand the, the confusion that can accompany darkness. It seems that there's always some light somewhere one would have to go far out into our deserts or or perhaps on a ship onto the ocean to experience the the totality of the darkness to which Jesus refers. One year our unit was training in the High Sierras at the Marine Mountain Warfare Training Camp, located 20 miles or so north of Bridgeport. With a base elevation of 6,800 feet and surrounded by training areas that had had elevations up to almost 12,000 feet, It was an area utilized to train Marines for mountain warfare and to sharpen map and compass skills that would be used in in that kind of a a unique environment. Now this was before GPS systems, so the ability to get from point A to point B was completely dependent upon one's ability to accurately use a map, and a compass. And the final exercise was a three-day land navigation course. Marines were sent out in groups of four, clothed only in their their uniforms and a jacket, and they were given a radio, water, a map, and a compass. And groups had to find locations miles and miles apart to get their food, to get their sleeping bags and fresh water. Now, it was November. It was very, very cold. And the exercise was a challenging one. And daytime was marked by cold and long distances between the sites that needed to be found. They could be, they could be as far as seven or eight miles apart. Elevations were as high as 11,000 feet. And night was another thing altogether. Darkness confuses. Darkness distorts. Darkness is often dangerous. And the groups went out And my friend and I were designated as the rescue team. That meant that when groups got lost, Roger and I would try to to walk them through on the radio how to use their tools to identify exactly where they were. But particularly at night, it was difficult to do the steps necessary to identify their location. So each night, Roger and I would head out to find a lost team, to get them oriented and on the right path to their next objective. It was, for Roger and I, great fun. For the groups, not so much. It wasn't so much fun for these teams. They were lost. They were tired and hungry, thirsty, and in danger of freezing to death. 
Inevitably, we would ask these lost teens in the darkness to light a small fire. Because you see, those points of light could be seen for miles. And the light guided us to the lost. The light reminded the groups that help was coming. The light warned them in temperatures well below freezing. Light will do that, won't it? Light is warmth. Light is, is direction. Light is comfort. Light is hope. Darkness, although increasingly difficult to experience in our physical reality today, is nonetheless increasing in our polarized, secularized, morally and ethically challenged culture. The great grand narratives around which our culture used to gather are breaking down in the midst of radical individualism and moral and ethical relativity. It is tempting in the face of this confusion to withdraw. Withdraw to our gated communities. Withdraw to communities that might serve as the last embodiment of those values we hold dear. Withdraw to our, to our spiritual enclaves, holy huddles, where we face one another, link arms, and turn our backs to those we deem not like us or from the world that we condemn. It might be tempting, but friends, it is not faithful. Notice what Jesus says. Notice what Jesus claims. Jesus claims to be the light of the world. The world. Not our sanctuary neighborhoods. Not our sanctuary communities. Not our holy huddles. Hoarding the light of Christ only for ourselves. No, Jesus claims to be the light of and for the world. The light of Christ that brings warmth and inclusion. The light of Christ that gives comfort and strength. The light of Christ that finds the lost and reorients the wayward. The light of Christ that provides wisdom and direction. That light, as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, is meant to be displayed for all to see that light is for you that light is for me that light is for the world jesus as the light of the world transforms each and every soul yes but Jesus, as the light of the world, is also meant to, to transform the very world in which we live. All too often, we create this, this false distinction. We create borders, boundaries, between our spiritual and secular worlds. It is as though faith gets compartmentalized to Sundays and our secular, worldly needs and desires are sovereign on Monday through Saturday. Here in America, we have misunderstood and misapplied the constitutional separation between church and state. In the world in which our country was founded and the Constitution was written in Europe, governmental officials felt free to dictate how the churches would function. And governments actually persecuted particular forms of religious expression because these believers were viewed as a threat to the state's power and influence. But here in America, we have very carefully directed that the state, our governments, have no authority 
in the life, ministry, and service of our churches. The government cannot tell the church what to do, what to declare, whom to serve. And unfortunately, far too many of us have fallen into the trap of believing that the faithful then have no voice in our community, no ability to enter into the public arena and voice spiritual truth. No, we cannot claim a favored position, but we can claim a position. And unfortunately, far too many of us keep the light of Christ restricted only to our enclaves, restricted to our spiritual holy huddles. Jesus claims to be the light of the whole world. The whole world. Jesus is the light. The light is truth. Light chases away the darkness, the confusion and despair, the alienation and sense of being lost. That light is meant to be shared with love, with compassion. The light of Christ is not a torch with which we beat the lost. No, the light of Christ is not some kind of cultural bug zapper. The light of Christ is a light of love, a light of understanding, a light that welcomes all to its midst. Upon the first encounter, we might not fully understand the light. Upon first encounter, we might not understand how it welcomes, how it warms, how it transforms. But stay with that light long enough Stay with Jesus long enough. And not only will we understand, but we will also embrace the opportunity to share that light with others. Friends, Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Embrace and be transformed by that, by that light. Embrace be transformed, and then let's offer that light to those still lost in the darkness. Let us then together shine that light into the dark recesses of our world. And in that way, through the light of Christ, even creation itself is transformed. Amen. In Jesus the Christ, we are fed the bread of life. Bread that sustains us in this life and the next. In Jesus Christ, we receive the light of the world, chasing away the darkness that would otherwise overwhelm us. Jesus is God's gift to us. Jesus is God's gift gift to us, a gift given to us by God strictly out of his love, strictly out of his grace and mercy, and thanks now then for that gift, we receive our morning offerings. I invite you to pray with me. Holy God, your Son is the bread of life that you share with us in abundance. Your Son is the light of the world which brings hope, understanding, comfort, and strength. Together with the Holy Spirit, O oh God, you have redeemed the world for yourself. 
and we are eternally grateful. As an expression of obedience and thankfulness, we bring these tithes and offerings to you. May they further the work of your church. May they facilitate the shining of your divine light into a dark world. Gracious God, help us to be participants in the building of your kingdom. May we and these gifts reflect your light into the world. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, choir. That was hard to sit still to that very upbeat music. He is the light of the world. You almost feel like you want to get up and dance to that. So thank you for, for, for doing that beautiful piece for all of us. At this time, it's time for us to do our prayer together. And however you're comfortable sitting at home doing this prayer, some people like to get down on their knees and pray, and some people just like to, to sit comfortable in a chair but we'll raise our voices together as one, as one body of Christ. So let us pray. Breath of God, send your spirit among us and bring us closer to you, Lord. During this season of Lent, we are reminded of our own struggles and difficulties, realizing that you are the same compassionate guide leading us forward just as you led your people through the wilderness to the promised land. Lord, you are our dividing guide, even when the path has seemed very dark. Like this past year, as we lived in the shadow of the pandemic, it felt like our lives were marked with such grief and fear. And even though at the time we could not see the end of the crisis, 
You were with us in our despair. You were strong in our weakness as you led us through to safety. And yes, you are still with us. So we ask you to ignite your spirit within our hearts, within our minds and souls, to let your light shine into our brokenness. Help us to trade the ashes of our lives for the beauty of your presence. Trade our grief for the oil of joy and gladness from your spirit. Trade our despair for hope and praise. And with grateful hearts, we believe that seasons of darkness will fade away. And you are with us whatever we face, trusting that you are greater than anything we will ever encounter. And Lord, we look forward to whatever is next, knowing that you are even there waiting for us with open arms. May you continue to lead us through the journey of wilderness of this world to the glory of the world to come. And Lord, we pray for your church. May it be a safe place for the young and the old, a refuge for those that are lost, and a shelter for all. We pray for the whole world, for evil powers to be destroyed, that you will give justice to those who have been harmed by war, violence, famine, poverty, abuse, and hatred. And we pray for those in leadership in this nation and throughout the world. Lord, may they come to know you and humbly seek you as they lead. Pour out your spirit of peace on your people here at LNPC. Protect our children, grandchildren, our husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, parents and friends. Wrap your arms of healing around those with a new diagnosis, those who are bedridden, those suffering from pain, whether that's mental, spiritual, or physical, and be with those who are grieving or struggling with anxiety, loneliness, or sadness. Lord, you are the ultimate healer. Let us all flourish again through Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, just want to remind you that we will be live streaming our annual meeting at 1 p.m. today. But if you are registered, please, please, please come to the sanctuary. Come a little early because we're going to have to get you screened in. 
but please come to the sanctuary. We need a quorum to be able to conduct our business. In a lost, weary, and darkened world, Jesus is the light of the world. What will we do with that light? With it, as we reflect that light through the power and mystery of the Holy Spirit, we can participate in God's transformation of the world. My friends, as you go forth from this place, choose to walk with the Lord who is devoted to you. And may the choices you make in the week ahead reveal your devotion to him. Amen. May we be blessed as we go on our way. May we be kept in safety and love. May grace and compassion find their way to every soul. May this be our blessing. Amen.